Okay, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had enjoyed uh, the session with Kevin. I personally enjoyed it a lot, and I'll comment in a minute. So uh, for those joining right now, welcome uh, to the session. Uh, we are going now uh, with a very interesting session with like people that I admire a lot. I will comment on them in a minute. So please, if you have questions, uh, you have the uh, comment function on YouTube or LinkedIn. Uh, and please don't hesitate to ask. I will be paying attention here to make sure we bring your questions uh, to uh, the speaker. So let me introduce them uh, right now. So very amazing people. So I will start introducing Rita, Rita McGrath. I think many of you know her. She's a best-selling author. I have her book here with me. One, I mean, one of my favorite books, actually, uh, See Around Corners. I have a, dedica a dedicatory, actually, from Rita here. For Claudio, is no melts. Rita, oh, I love that. So <laughs> Rita, has, she is a longtime professor of Columbia Business School. She's widely recognized as a premier expert on lead innovation and growth during times of uncertainty. So many awards, I mean, few of them, uh, she will receive the Achievement Award for Strategy from uh, Thinkers50 uh, that many of you know, and it's one of the partners in the session here today. And he have been consistently named one of the top uh, 10 management thinkers in the world. You know, so uh, she, I mean, I show you like this book, but there, there are many others. I love discovery driven, driven innovation, the add of competi competitive uh, advantage, so many things here. So thank you, Rita, for joining us. Second person that I want to introduce, Tony, Tony Odrisco, a professor, a speaker, author, advisor. I mean, I also have a book from Tony, the last book, Everyday Superhero. Love the book. Very interesting. It's a book that you can read in one, two hours, insightful, straight straight message. Thank you, uh, Tony, for joining us today. So more about Tony. Tony teaches at Duke University, Focus School of Business and Pratt School of Engineering. And of course, he is also a research fellow at Duke University, Duke, Duke Corporate Education. And I mean, he, he focuses a lot on like applying cutting edge academic research in increasingly complex business challenge. So in the, he is one of the my favorite persons to have a chat. You know, when you have a chance, I always talk to him. So thank you, Tony, for joining here. And the last one, uh, Martin, Martin Reeves. I also have a book of Martin, the last one, The Imagination Machine. I had a lot of fun reading. I don't have a dedicatory yet. I'm sure I will have soon. So uh, Martin, thank you for joining. Martin, for those that don't know him, she, he's a senior partner at BCG San Francisco office and chairman of the BCG Henderson Institute. Uh, so he explored a lot of ideas about beyond the world of business. He's a, maybe is the most interesting generalist that I know, you know, that I I, 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 I have interacted with. So he uh, is co-author of this book that I, I showed here, The Imagination Machine, but many others. I love the other one that is your strategy needs a strategy, how to choose and execute the right approach. So thank you all of you. Uh, let me start this session here. Uh, is, uh, I want to start with you, Tony. I mean, uh, it's very insightful, I mean, what we heard uh, right now from Kevin, zero distance from the customers, you no know, budget, budgeted decisions on the edge. I saw Rita commenting on the chat. So uh, marketplace for internal functions and the business ecosystem kind of approach with clients is very different. But uh, what I would love to explore and start with you is about what's the opportunity here? What is the signal? Uh, we, we see so many times companies trying different models, different like approach to organize them for a like changing world but what's the the, the message here even more like uh, coming from a company that was not like a startup but a kind of like traditional company yeah i i think it comes down to leadership um uh, i had the great uh, privilege of being with kevin a couple of weeks ago and um he walks the talk when he says i'm not going to kill the smoker just because I don't like smoked meat doesn't mean that there's not a market for it. And how, how, how should I be the one to stop the marketplace from, from creating? So what I took away is um, you need a micro enterprise of hipsters, hackers, and hustlers. Uh, and then you need a cave that's big enough to invite the customer in and co-create. Now, that's easy enough to say. And you can you can see these same kind of patterns of, and Rita talks a lot about this, of, of, of you know, the sense the sense making happens at the edge. Snow melts from the edges is what Rita likes to say. And and we tend to, in organizations, be cocooned in the middle. I don't necessarily want to say just in a hierarchy, but it's kind of like we live in our cocoon, so we don't feel feel that the heat at the edge or the cold at the edge as much because we're kind of isolated or insulated, if you will. Uh, and, and this turns the model on its head. It kind of says the, the, the central functions uh, are there to support those micro enterprises. 
as they co-create with customers. And, and, and then you get the kind of the paradox of you, the faster you, the bigger you grow, the faster you go. Um, and that doesn't seem to, to hold up to logic when you work within a hierarchical system where kind of all the information has to flow in and up and decisions have to get made and pushed back out and down. And the latency effect of, of that kind of decision making and the, and the kind of throttling of idea flow inside the organization then kind of uh, essentially makes it regress to a mean of mediocrity that, that you, you, you can't essentially kind of keep pace with the market, which is something that, that Kevin said. But I feel... Um, you know, we all look to leadership and unless leadership kind of essentially demonstrates change behavior as opposed to demanding it, uh, you're not going to get the change you heard about today with GE, in my opinion. No, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Let me move to Rita right now. And Rita, I want to take your, uh, your uh, insights about this session of Kevin as well. But I mean, I love like that. I mean, there's like this challenge uh this tension between efficiency, adaptability that, that we've seen even more happening right now during COVID and during like a lot of like uh, uh, challenges we had in the world right now. And your work, it's a lot about that. You know, it's like bringing like this uh, flexibility, adaptability to the way we think about strategy and organizations. But I would love to see your your, your thoughts about this session, Kevin, how that, uh, uh, which are the insights you get uh, to, to recommend organizations uh, to pay attention to. Well, one of the things that really struck me about Kevin's observations was uh, the effect of power uh, and and how if you really want to create a company that behaves this way, you have to be willing to give up power. And that means giving up the executive jet and that means giving up the corner office and all the, the trappings of hierarchy. You know, when I reflect back on the companies I've worked with that have come to grief, you know, very often there's a strong association with executive perks. So I'll just pick on GE for, for a minute, you know, classic GE where Kevin came from, right? Um, and I remember being up at Crotonville, which was their big training facility. By the way, it's now for sale, which is a, a dagger to the heart of many of us who taught there for many, many years. Uh, but, but you know, you'd have Jeff Immelt like arriving in his helicopter and it was the chairman has arrived, right? And and it was all that, that power and that sense of, here's the person with a view across the whole enterprise who's gonna make these enterprise-wide decisions and, and all that power and all those perks. And I think in organizations, what we come to confuse is the generation of real value with the trappings of power and rewards and the perks that all that comes with. And I think Kevin put it very well. He said, you know, if that's what you're going for, you're never going to operate this way. If, if, if what you want is the corner office and the private jet and the corporate helicopter, this is totally antithetical to what you want, but it also is antithetical to what the customer wants. No, I love that. I love that. You know, and, and I think there's a lot of implications that I want to explore later about how we think about leadership, career, you know, managing people, uh, management process as well. I think we'll go to Martin. Uh, Martin, I, I've read a lot of your work and you do a lot of research about how organizations uh, find new designs or new features of design to try to uh, respond to this world right there. And one thing that... Uh, you have discussed a lot in your articles is about like the role of technology coming and like many AI and how that's that have a very huge potential about how we that we it's going to impact organizations. It's going to impact like the role of leaders, the role of professionals. I mean, coming to this topic like beyond hierarchy, new models, and the role of strategy. What do, would you comment on this? How do you do you see like the tendencies, the the trends that we could explore as organizations? Um, yeah, it's great to be here with you all on a wonderful topic. Um, I mean, maybe let me begin by with some clarifying of thinking because, you know, words can be treacherous. Um, so there is a sense in which, um, you know, heavy top-down structures um, are um, obsoleted by technology or are required to change. But, um, you know, the first thing I'd say is let's not be too rapid in writing off a bureaucracy. I mean, hierarchical organization is... Uh, prevalent in nature, it's the um, it's the uh, the basis for uh, military commands. Um, it, it it put a man on the moon. So I think there's a confusion between a structure and some behaviours that we associate when that structure is employed by large corporates. So large corporates can be uh, they can be slow, they can be um, uh, conservative, they can be introverted. Um, you know, I'd, I'd treat that as a bug rather than a a feature of um, of, of of bureaucracy. Um, 
Now, I think um, technology is forcing us to do a number of things differently. It's forcing us to, to be faster. Algorithmic speeds are very fast. Um, uh, I, I think it is taking away some operations from humans. Um, so when we embrace alternative organizational structures, <clears throat> maybe we should even consider more radical alternatives. Um, bureaucracy literally means the, uh, the rule at the desk. Um, you know, I think already we're in the, ra the realm of computocracy, which is, um, you know, the rule of computation. So, you know, something a bit like a bureaucracy, but more flexible may not be going quite far enough in the conception. Um, you know, a third, a third thing to think about here, I think, is that, you know, my experience is that structure guarantees nothing. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm naturally very curious. So I'm, I, I love going to see, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Huawei structure or, um, um, you know, the Zappos structure. But, I, you know, one of the things I have to say is that, you know, I, I went in pursuit of novelty, but I think you can find ordinary. I think you can find incompetent. I think you can find effective within within any structure. Um, and, and so, you know, let us not pin too many hopes on, um, you know, on the, on the, on the variable uh, structure. I prefer to think in terms of strategies, what I call the strategy stack. Um, so it used to be when I first joined BCG that there were strategy projects, there were organizational projects, there were procurement projects. I personally have not done a strategy project for about 20 years that didn't also involve organization um, and technology and, and, and human relations. Um, so I think you, what you need to think about is, you know, coherent systems of management that touch all of these things, um, rather than just saying, you know, hierarchy is bad, let's do away with that and, and, and everything will be fine. But um, that, that's sort of like a little bit of clarification of the, of the words which I think can trip us up. So um, let me just give some headlines uh, for how I think technology is changing strategy in business, and then we can maybe dig into some of that. Um, so I, th I think... Um, I was thinking about this the other day. I, th I think there are sort of six ways in which st strategy and management is changing relative to 1989 when I joined BCG. I think one of them is um, speed. <clears throat> you know, I think we have to do things faster. Um, we know that um, competitive advantage decays about 10 times faster than it used. Also, we have to be fast. Um, I think another one is uncertainty. Um, not just, you know, we had a crisis, so things are uncertain, but persistent multidimensional uncertainty where we have to think about geopolitics and society and all those things at the same time. I think a third one is openness. Um, you know, most times people talk, talk about organization, they talk about their organization. Um, you know, ecosystems um, are beyond the organization. Uh, politics is beyond the organization. I think a lot, a lot more is happening beyond the organization. The, the context of the company is as important as... Uh, what's happening in the company. The, the fourth one, which is really revolutionary, is algorithmic, uh, which is, it's already the case. Um, maybe some very traditional companies don't realize just how much it's progressed, but algorithmic decision-making is a major part of, of, of many businesses. And that presents all sorts of issues and, and opportunities that we can dig into. I think the fourth one is, uh, the fifth one, sorry, is contingency. In other words, um, you know, my, my analysis says that the range of competitive conditions is now so great that you shouldn't look for the one way of doing strategy, the one way of doing organization. You should rather ask, in this situation, for this particular business at this time, what is the best way of approaching this problem? And the last one um, is, I, I guess I've already touched on it, um, under openness, which is contextuality, which is think about influence, not control, because many of the people you need to influence don't actually work for you. Um, uh, you know, 99% of the people touched by... Um, Alibaba and Amazon don't work for those two companies, so they need influence mechanisms, uh, not, uh, uh, not, not, not control mechanisms. So I think that, you know, that's the stuff which is changing, which changes the context of everything in strategy and management. Uh, I wouldn't reach for one alternative to, to hierarchy and write off, you know, hierarchy in, in, in entirely. And, and I think it's about, you know, strategy and organization, what is it? It's, it's a tool to get a job done. So it's whatever copes best with those circumstances. And maybe we don't have all the answers yet. One of the interesting things that's happening in strategy right now is a lot of the innovation is in practice. Sometimes in, in, in strategy, theory leads practice, and sometimes practice leads theory. I think right now, practice is leading theory. So it's an exciting time to, to be a strategist. No, I see that. I mean, one one question that comes to my mind is that even if there is not a model that uh, is one model fits all, you know, I mean, there may be features that we need to pay attention. I think you comment some of them, like influencing, you know, uh, 
the 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 the, the, front, the border of the organization is kind of mingled with like other realities. So this concept of business ecosystem uh, that I mean, I love like when he he says zero distance from the client. You know that you're so connected with the client that the the speed of innovation happens there, and it's difficult to track if you're not engaged with them. So, come back to you, Rita. I mean, uh, is what? How do you see like this feature change? Because we still have like, uh, for example, a uh, budget in organizations that are the traditional one. Investors expecting expecting the forecast. You know, so this whole mechanism that are the traditional in your organization that needs to shift to not to one different model. I mean, one, but different features, you know, uh, how do we interact with them? I would love to hear from you about like this shift that we uh, we should expect happening. Well, so with, with budgeting specifically, um, there's some fantastic work that's been done by a group called the Beyond Budgeting yep. Institute, um, in which they talk about budgeting being a very different exercise in this sort of annual painful ritual where, you know, you forecast a little bit less than you think you can deliver, and you're probably pushing you to forecast a little bit more than you think you can deliver, and it's just this horrible negotiation, um, all premised on the idea that next year is going to be a lot like last year, right? So budgeting in its traditional form has a lot of flaws, which I think we're now beginning to recognize. And, and you know, with today's technology, you can rebudget things very quickly. Um, I remember talking to Sanjay Purohit, who was the head of Infosys uh, strategy group for many years. Uh, and he said, you know, we rebudget re the entire company every quarter. He said, uh, we're a growth company. I, I don't want four quarters to go by before I find out what the hell's going on, right? And so that flexibility of being able to adapt your resources as your uh, demands are placed upon your organization, I think that's something that we're starting to see becoming more and more the norm and less and less this kind of painful annual fixed budget, this is what you've got for an entire year. I mean, if you think about it, that's crazy, right? And the things would remain static for an entire year. Um, so I think that's changing. I think we're seeing um, a lot that's really shifting. One of the things I talk about is, is I call it a new playbook for strategy. Um, and it really has to do with accepting that change is the normal thing, not stability. And that's a big shift, right? I mean, strategy itself came from industrial economics, which makes two assumptions. You know, industries exist and the normal state of things is equilibrium. And, you know, I think the first principle of the new playbook is no, the normal state of things is not necessarily equilibrium. Uh, second, we have to get smarter about stopping stuff. So I call that healthy disengagement. How do we get out of things that are no longer serving our purpose as well? And, um, um, you know, Kevin didn't mention this, but I know that at higher, one of the things they're very good at right now is, you know, if something doesn't get a critical mass of interest from customers or stakeholders or whatever, it kind of dies. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't get to live on, right? Uh, third thing is this resource question, which gets to budgeting, right? which is how do you get your best resources against your best opportunities? Fourth, we need innovation as a proficiency, right? Not a thing that happens once every four years. And oh, let's do a boot camp, let's have innovation at the end. Thousands of post-it notes die a horrible death while we ideate. Uh, we need to make it a real proficiency. Um, fifth, this has huge implications for leadership. And we need leaders who are, as Kevin described, very discovery driven. You know, what's the new information I've got to work with? What does that suggest I need to be thinking about now? And lastly, all of this takes place against a backdrop of the people. And increasingly, what we're seeing is a tour of duty, um, talent environment, where people will sign up for something, they'll stick with it for a while, and then situations change, the job gets done, they're ready for new, a new challenge, maybe you can't provide it, maybe they leave, maybe they come back. Much different talent situation than we would have had historically. So I think we are looking at a new playbook. Oh, I love that. I use that as a segue to go back to Tony about leadership. You started with leadership, Tony, and uh, that, that, it's not only the implication for leaders, how do they behave, you know, the predominant kind of behaviors and uh, leadership skills, but it's also for the whole uh, leadership like system that we understand today for organizations. So you manage talent, how you recognize new leaders, how, I mean, there is a lot of uh, work is still being done using like uh, leadership pipeline or, you know, traditional. How, how do you see that? How is the transformation here? Not only for the leader itself, but, but the whole way that you think about people in organizations. Yeah. I mean, I think to quote Charles Handy, organizations are nothing without people. So whether you talk about GE appliances, you talk about IBM, um, 
if the people don't show up, you've just got an inert set of machines and processes and buildings and chairs and so on and so forth. So literally people breathe life into the organization. Ironically, um, the traditional, the tyranny of the tangible, the structures and processes that we put in place are typically put in place to maximize profitability on the last value opportunity that we saw. And then we harden around those particular structures, processes and technologies to kind of open the jaws of profitability. In so doing, we kind of, uh, as Dorothy Leonard Barton would say, that those core competencies that we build to maximize profitability in the prior instantiation of what we were looking to do to create and capture value, uh, limit us from seeing the next thing and frustrate the people because the people at the edge who might see a new opportunity, essentially, it's the inverse of what Kevin was talking about. They essentially have to go and strap on the armor to go back into their own organization uh, to, to, to kind of pull people across functional silos, to, to work outside of the traditional functions to get something done. Because I call this structural lag. We tend to be structurally out of phase with the reality in the marketplace on an ongoing basis because we get into this whole structural problem that I think Martin uh, alluded to earlier. Um, and, and so I, I'm, I, I, I kind of feel that, you know, if you have people who have that passion and motivation and they're given the autonomy, right, uh, and the accountability on the other side. So there's aspiration. What's what's the shared aspiration that we ha that we want to achieve together? There's alignment in how I can find my own motivation towards that aspiration. There's autonomy in knowing that I'm allowed to apply my discretionary effort where I think I can add the most value. And then there's accountability, which is and, and in so doing, I'm accountable for delivering. You get those four. You start to get this adaptability and agility to be able to kind of uh, sense and respond at the edge rather than wait for permission from the middle. Uh, that requires a completely different framing of what leadership is. When we say leader, uh, we tend to think about it as a person and a role. Uh, and I actually think in organizations, we have customer relationship systems, ERP systems, MRP systems. And I feel that organizations are leadership systems. Um, and, and the one requirement for leadership that's universal, I believe, is followership, that people will follow you. Uh, and, and if you do the kind of work, organizational network analysis, you see, you know, there's the formal hierarchy and there's the informal network. And most work gets done through the informal network. And you ask people, who would you follow into a storm? Who, who, who would you want to be with uh, during a major transformation? Um, and what we find from that research is fully 30 percent of the people that other people would follow are not on any formal hierarchical secession plan. So we have this kind of we have this nebulous term called leadership that we tend to ascribe to the hierarchy. And when Kevin went to hire and said, "Show me the org chart," he was looking for who who are the leaders in the in the pyramid that I can go talk to, and they couldn't find one. Uh, there's ways of X-raying organizations now where you can understand what the trust network looks like, or what the energy network looks like, or what the decision making network looks like, or who the culture keepers are. Um, and, and I feel that we have a far higher resolution set of technologies. Back to Martin's point, where we can really understand who works with whom to get what done in, in, in a much more um, organic way. And, and that the leadership system, to, to, to Kevin's point, needs to support that organic flow. If you look at teams in general, right? This goes back to the work that Rob Cross did years ago, looking at consulting teams. And this we relate to Martin's business that, you know, there's some teams that dramatically outperform others, just like we hear this with software as well. There's software teams that dra dramatically outperform others. And, and when you started to try to get to the core of what was that, that was that created a 10 X differentiation in teams performance, it was energy. I feel energy in working together that you can do that with the san francisco basketball team you can do that with a software team it's that uh the group feels that they are contributing uh within and across they're bringing their best selves to what it is and they have a unique contribution um and and if you if you can unlock what i call discretionary effort what people do because they're compelled to not because they're commanded to that's that's what the kind of leadership system you need and i think it's the one that that um that kevin was starting to articulate However, in order for any of that to happen, going back to my time at IBM, it doesn't happen, uh, happen unless the formal leader in the hierarchy, instead of getting out of their helicopter, as Rita talks about, let's go to grow, behaves in, it is so, so differently that, that people say, whoa, this is for real. And uh, I have permission, perhaps, to now exercise my discretionary effort. Uh, and when the first failure happens, that there's coverage for that failure, because there will be many failures, 249 to one, according to Alex Osterwalder, if you want to r run a portfolio of kind of uh, possibility. 
So, Claudio, I'm, I'm not sure well, you'd be happy yeah. for me to be disruptive and jump in there to get some cross. I would love it. That one would provoke you. Yes. Oh no, Martin. Um, so, you know, I, th I think what are we what are we talking about here? Right? I, I think at one level we're talking about, um, you know, changes in the world that require new ways of managing. Um, you know, I think the temptation is to say not that way, th this one way, and um, you know, I, th I think a sort of a maybe a more nuanced way of thinking about it is, um, you know, in terms of calibrating trade-offs. So I think, I think, you know, behind all of the, the new organizational forms and the supposed badness of the old organizational forms, I think there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off between autonomy and alignment going on. Um, clearly, if everything in the company was dictated by the market, there was no common instructions at all, anything could be reinvented at any time, you don't have a company. You have a you have a rather chaotic market, um, which may be the answer in some cases, but but probably not many. Um, um, so you certainly need some alignment, but you also need some some autonomy in a in a changing world where you know the hierarchy is just not fast enough to run things up and down the decision chain. So, you know, I think I think one one question I'd like to put to to, to Rita and, and, and Tony is, you know, how many ways do we do we have of of balancing? Um, you know, autonomy and and alignment. You know, what, whatever whatever the structure, because um, we know that this is not a new problem, right? This was, um, you know, von Moltke in the in the Prussian military uh, faced this problem uh, in the uh, uh, in the eighteen seventies. Uh, you know, and he had an answer, which was commander's intent, which is give people rough a rough direction, but not precise instructions. And we know that you know NASA struggled with this to put a man on the moon. The engineering needed to work. Um, but also they needed sort of, you know, learning when things went wrong, as it did on the Apollo th you know, 13 mission. So organizationally and strategically, what other ways do we have of understanding how to balance this? Yeah, we can start with you, Rita. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think you need both, right? I mean, uh, if you take even children, right, um, it, what we know about human development is that there is a necessary amount of support, absolutely, but also challenge. And one of the dilemmas I think of human development is if you if you if you have just support, you know, like everybody's above average, and you know we all get awards for most improved and whatnot. If if that's all you have, right, you never develop um, mastery. You know, you never develop competence. You never develop that that skill and that intuition that comes from trying multiple things and failing and learning and trying again and having the grit to stick with it. So I think if I take that analogy to organizations, there's a need to structure environments where there is both support. Yes, you get the resources that you need, you get the freedom that you hunger for, you get the ability to do things, but there's also challenge, right? There's there's rules you have to adhere to and there's compliance you have to need to deal with. And you know, there's things that you have to be taking care of because you're part of the tribe right and so i think there's there's sort of this uber theme of you need both and and we constantly want to get away from it right we, we constantly say oh you know challenge we don't really want to talk about that you know let's talk about the fun stuff the sparklies you know right, absolutely i mean um you know you, there is the the divergent part of uh, of um innovation um you know new ideas and unleashing autonomy but um of course, you have to close down some stuff. You mentioned that as one of your principles. Um, uh, rarely do you spontaneously have a group of people deciding, you know, let's let's close down precisely that thing. You know, a certain amount of alignment is necessary to make that sort of con convergent decision. And um, I sometimes fear with all of the fashion around, um, you know, agile approaches and so on that we're just essentially talking about one element of the equation now. You know, it's good to balance the discussion to have that other end of the equation, but it's bad to believe that the equation is just the you know, just just one side of it, you know. Well, and if you think about human beings dealing with uncertainty, we're terrible at it. We absolutely mm -hmm. are terrible at it. We freeze, yeah. you know, we don't know what to do. We get stuck. We don't make decisions. And, you know, I mean, the dirty little secret of a lot of humanity is for a lot of people, they like having the structure. You know, they like knowing this is the time I go to work and this is the time we take lunch and this is the time we take breaks. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think somehow we've gone way over on the other end. So, you know, everybody wants to come to work in black T-shirts and be creative. And you know, that's not everybody's cup of tea. I mean, there are people whose life, you know, even at a very professional level, involves getting one quarter of one percent of tolerance off of that particular specification. And that's what they thrive on. And I, I think we need to build organizations where we can have multiple right. sets of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and Tony, that was like the, the theme of your book in a way, as I read it. Um, um, you know, you had these uh, renegades in your 
in your manga novel that, uh, <laughs> that uh, went against the traditional approaches and um uh, but they but their approach was uh you know was was the new norm in a in, in, in a sense and presumably at some point that would require revolution too so how do you yeah. How did you, you know, in the thinking behind the manga, how did you think about balancing the forces of stability and structure with the, with the forces of uh, creative destruction? Well, I, I think I think right on. And, and, and when we last talked about the book, you picked that out. You can only do one thing in a book. And I was trying to paint the picture of, you know, what, what the explore context looks like. Um, coming from Ireland, we have a saying, there's horses for courses. Right? <laughs> Um, and so in, 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 the core, in, in the environment where outcome predictability is high and environmental certainty is high, bureaucracy rules. It's awesome. Right? Right? It, it's like it's that, totally. that is the system. Silos are rock. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and those functions do what they do well and the rules are set up, whether you're, whether you're Weber or Fayol or whoever, like that, that, that's the model. And, and also... Um, I don't want I don't want um, the job of accounting to be done by an innovator, and I don't want the job of an innovator to be done by an accountant. And and and, and therefore, so I think the first the first error we make, and it goes back to what what uh, what Rita was saying, is as human beings, and Kevin alluded to this. He said we're on a path, but when we hit an impasse, the likelihood is to regress back to what we know. We're friendly with familiarity. The devil we know is better than the devil we don't. So, so our, our, our overarching tendency as human beings is to kind of, uh, you know, go back to what we know. And, and biologically, that happens too. Like the blood gets, if, if, if we have a position of fear, our executive function shuts down. And, you know, we think about freeze or flight, uh, mostly freeze these days, maybe not, not fight or flight. Um, so, so the first problem is, uh, Martin, to your context on, you, you talked about context. I call this the X factor. What key are we in? Are we in the key of predictability? Are we in the key of stability? Are, are we in the key of environmental certainty? Rock the hierarchy, if you want to keep going with the music metaphor, if, uh, or, or the orchestra. Uh, however, if we're in the key of um, uncertainty and, and, and as we emerge from the liminality of COVID, we, we're not necessarily sure what the progression path is. We've had to let go of what we know, but we're still reaching for what, where we're going and we don't know. Um, there, it's it, it, it's it's massive experimentation. It's it, it's trial and error. So so the first problem I think is that we we unconsciously uh, want to make the world simpler than it is. We don't recognize the, the 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 depth of complexity or the rate of change that we're dealing with. The other two factors you talked about. So we kind of say you know we 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 miss the law of requisite comp. Uh, uh, complexity. We we try to oversimplify things down, and then when, when we when we break it down beyond the level of complexity we're at, the solutions don't work. The second thing is, even if we acknowledge that the environment is complex, um, we still fall back into trying to do what we used to do harder. You know, it's like shouting yeller, yelling louder in English to somebody who speaks French and hoping they'll understand. The 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 the, the equipment, the tools, the structure, the process are not suited to the reality of the context we operate in. So, absolutely right, Martin. I, what I was trying to paint in that book was a picture of what it's like to work in the explorer side of the equation when we're working more in a networked way, where we're unlocking discretionary effort. But those are not the people you want to be kind of trying to test every progression or idea that they come up with. You want the bureaucrats kind of killing that. Instead of instead of if you think about the bureaucracy as kind of killing things in the department of no, that's great because if you've got to wean through 250 ideas to find one that's really going to add value, you kind of need to be very disciplined in killing things sooner, which is a lot of what Alex talks about. So, so there, I think the bureaucracy can have a huge impact in kind of weaning out, you know, what won't work. Yeah, I love the music analogy because um, you know it's very intuitive. I mean, there's some music going on and. The musicians do need to coordinate, and there are different ways of doing that, right? If it's if it's Beethoven, have a score and a conductor. If it's uh, mm -hmm. if it's Duke Ellington, then imp improvise. And uh, mm -hmm. we've got a new contender too, which is um, uh, algorithmic music, which is maybe you know maybe some of the music is doesn't require anything from us. Um, uh, well, it does, of course. Select the algorithm; it's indirect control. Um, uh, but but I think. Um, you know, just reaching for one for one key uh, or one way of playing music is is bound to come unstuck under under some circumstances. I mean, there is this beautiful mathematical proof, um, the No Free Lunch theorem, that shows that it's in, it's mathematically impossible to have a solution algorithm for all problems. Like, it, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as a as a universal answer in any in any walk of life. If it's true of arithmetic, it's got to be true of everything else. 
Um, but I sometimes think in management that we we have you know serial fads which say the next thing is the entire answer to everything. I think I, I think that's another key point, though, is um, to your point on technology, right? If we want to keep going with the music metaphor, the question then becomes, um, what are we organizing? And I think we're we're underestimating the organization of what I call the human machine interface, because machines today have their own intelligence. Uh, and, and, and in microseconds, they can uncover stuff that we can't. And, and, and I think our, 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 our organizational kind of landscape needs to acknowledge the fact that we now need a, a human machine interface that allows those algorithmic type of capabilities to perhaps go beyond, as you've mentioned, Martin, automation uh, into almost automaticity, that the, that the thing can run itself. But the thing that's required that humans can do better than anybody else is discernment and parsing context and kind of identifying frontiers. And if I may, back to your book, imagination or seeing around corners, as Rita says, that I don't know that there's an algorithm for yet. So if we can free up the human part of the system to see around corners or imagine possible futures, while we allow the machine intelligence piece to kind of um, do its thing that we largely might have seen as mundane or, or kind of boring. I, I feel we have to think about that much more broadly than we have. And I know you've done a lot of work in that in that context, like down at the millisecond context in understanding uh, massive amounts of data. Yeah. Looking for I mean, to, to, to say something um, controversial, maybe in a sense, um, practitioners need to become academics. So we need because the thing is, the direct action of the practitioner may not be the only intervention. I mean, for instance, in, in the algorithmic space, we can't intervene directly. We can't operate at the level, the speed of the algorithms, but we can have a theory um, about the system of ourselves plus the algorithms. And, and mm -hmm. we can, you know, we can test those theories. We need to think at different levels in the system. Is this a direct action problem? Um, you know, is this a sort of a, a partial planning problem? We try like your approach of, um, of, of, of sort of planned, uh, you know, planned discovery, planned exploration. Um, partly structured, but you're not structuring the actual outcomes and activities, you're, you're, you're structuring the process. Um, um, so I, so it's, I, th I think the more connected agents we have and the faster things move, the, the, less, we'll, the less it will be susceptible to linear logic, in which case um, we, need, we need ways of understanding and intervening into complex systems, which you can never do completely deductively. Um, you can recognize patterns, right? You can say this sort of situation, this works. You know, what key are we in, as, as you say, Tony? Um, or you can say, let me see if this, this thing works. Um, and if it doesn't, let me, let, let me, let me try something else. Yep. So uh, we have two minutes to three minutes to finish here. So uh, maybe one way to think here. I, mean, I, got, I got a lot of things. I, I see this tension, autonomy, alignment, efficiency, adaptability, stability, uncertainty that you need to recognize and manage. Uh, so what would be like an advice for all these people like uh, watching this uh, this uh, chat here, this conversation here, uh, that w which are the points that you should be careful about? You know, I mean, you cannot like, as you said, Martin, innovate uh, all the things and keep like things under control in your back. Uh, but I mean, which are the advice that so people could try new models, new ways to think about like how they operate in this environment? You know, so uh, maybe we could start with uh, you, Rita. Uh, and go to Martin and, and Tony. Sure. So I, there's no harm with your experimenting wherever you are in the organization, right? So there's no reason to ha have a miserable life at work. You, you can use your imagination, as Martin talks about, to come up with, uh, imagine connecting with four or five people across the organization about something that's important to the customer that you could actually have an impact on. I mean, think about how much more enriching and interesting your job would be, whatever your job is, right? So I think there's that, that idea of you don't need to seed agency to them. Love it. Yeah, you love it. Yeah. Martin. Um, well, uh, I think one idea I'm, I'm finding quite powerful in, in sorting through this complex dynamic context of management is, um, is the idea of never confusing um, a mental model with a fact. Um, you know, often we say, I have a 2% market share in the pharmaceuticals industry, and we think that's a fact. But you know, who said we're in the pharmaceuticals industry? What market? Um, <laughs> how do we measure two? You know, there's always um, 
something masquerading as a fact that's in fact a choice of a mental model. And by having alternative mental models and being choiceful about the models that we apply rather than moving immediate to, act, to action, I think it forces us to invest slightly more time in sense making, which is an essential part of triaging situations in order to be able to do the right thing. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And I, 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 I'd pick up on that and kind of add to it that I think there's there's kind of three big three big buckets that individuals and organizations uh, and probably society at large need, needs to think about. Perceiving is how we frame things and understand what's going on. Sense making is how do we kind of I, and I don't want to use the words break it down because that becomes too reductionist. But how do we make sense of what we're seeing? And that's why you need diversity of perspective in the perceiving phase because you want to see it from multiple perspectives. And then last is choreography, because I feel today, as we move more into arenas, as Rita has so eloquently written about, and, and, and ecosystems, where the, it's an infinite game. The goal there is to create an ecosystem that lives in perpetuity, where each component of that ecosystem adds value, and, 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 the, and, and each of the players in that game wants to stay in the game. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a finite game, it's a, an infinite game. And in that infinite game, uh, there's reciprocity and give and take. And so perceiving, sense-making, and choreography, I think, are kind of the new, the new lenses through which sense-making uh, occurs. And whether that's an individual in an organization trying to make sense of where can I add value to the customer, whether that's an organization trying to make sense of with whom do I need to partner outside my existing industry to create heretofore un unrecognized value, and then how do we do that in a way where... Um, there's a lot less uh, inequality in society. Th yep. Those seem to be the yep. issues that we're dealing with right now. No, I love that. I love it. I mean, there, there is so many things to talk here, you know, and uh, uh, unfortunately we are uh, short of time. So I want to really thank you. I mean, a lot of good insights uh, that they will try to leverage with uh, the practitioners that are coming next in the next session. So thank you, Tony. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, Martin. Thanks so much for making time to come here and talk to this group. I appreciate Thanks, that. Claudia. I hope you have, we can have this session I, um, sometime again. Some time with my favorite academics, my favorite. <laughs> <friends>. <laughs> Thank it. you all. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.